We'll start in Matthew 2. Matthew 2, verse 14. This, of course, is talking about the time that um, Mary and Joseph were in uh, Bethlehem, and they have been getting scared politically. There's some persecution coming their way, and they're not happy about it. He's been dreaming, and the dream says, uh, hey, you need to get out of town. You ever had those dreams? Wake up and say, well, yeah, that's the answer. Just run away. Now, here's a time that it's correct to run away. Watch this. Matthew 2, verse 14. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. Now, you and I would look at that and say, that's got to be wrong. He's getting up like a crook, like a thief, and stealing away in the middle of the night. And look where he's going. He's going to Egypt. I mean, we'd have a lot of bad things to say about that, wouldn't we? Verse 15, and was there until the death of Herod, he's doing what's good for him, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. Now, it was all done by prophecy. God intended it to be done this way. I'll bet you there were some rabbis in Israel that were shaking their heads, saying, all of that looks bad. They did it the wrong way. They went to Egypt. You shouldn't be going to Egypt. They went away as a little thief. They were hiding in the night, uh, but it was exactly right. There's some opposites. It's designed here. God's setting up a picture for the whole world to see, and he tells you right here, I've done this on purpose. I want to show an obvious Perfection is different than Egypt. I want to set this whole thing up. I'll even engineer politically some turmoil so that I can get these people into Egypt so I can pull them out of it. Look at it in Hosea. Hosea 11. Hosea 11 verse 1. It says, When Israel was a child, so the beginning of the nation, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Israel as a nation, God called out of Egypt. He's setting it up from the beginning. 4,000 years before this, he was saying with the nation, I want you to be the opposite of Egypt. And I want the world to see it. Now, you know what the problem was. The problem was Israel was not a good example of being the opposite of Egypt. There are some opposites that should maintain their separatism. Otherwise, you don't know the difference. That was the whole point that the priests were supposed to do is to show the people the difference between white and black. There's a dividing line between righteousness and wickedness. And here's the line, don't put your toe over. There should be some opposites. Biblically, spiritually, physically, in every way, there should be some opposites. They say this, this little phrase that sounds all positive and happy. The early bird gets the worm. That's good if you're a bird. Not so great if you're the worm. There are some opposites that are true. If one thing is good, then count on There is an opposite for it. That's wicked. Draw the line. Make it be plain. Our uh, text, look down at uh, verse 2. Hosea 11, verse 2. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Balaam. Just like you were saying in Jeremiah 8. The problem is the wicked should be the opposite. But the problem is when the opposite comes in and says, you don't have to be opposite us. Come join our party. The temptation is to drop the distinct. Christians should be distinct. We should be oddball. You should be different on purpose. Not, not just to be standing out, but biblically, because God says so. He says, and burn incense to graven image. I taught Ephraim also to go, taking them by the arms, but they knew not that I healed them. I drew them with cords of a man, with bands of love, and I was to them as they that take off the yoke on their jaw, and I laid meat unto them. That's just like a, a favorite pet or a, an animal that you care for. God's treating this nation uh, with baby steps, trying to get them right back to where he wants them to be. However, they won't come. Verse 5. He shall not return unto the land of Egypt. I'm trying to make them see there's a difference. But the Assyrian shall be his king because they refuse to return. Hmm. Now, God is so against Egypt. You see this all through the Bible, all through the Old Testament. He cannot stand Egypt. He says this is supposed to be a, a clear distinction. And because of that, the next time I want to correct them, I'm going to correct them with Assyria, not Egypt. And Assyria is bad news. Of course, e Egypt was too. If I was to compare the two, I would say 
Syria was worse than Egypt. That's the way I would see it. Egypt was fairly nice to them. Remember, they got the treasure cities to live in, in Egypt. They didn't get any treasure cities from Assyria. Assyria was demolishing. So, for us, God says, stay away from Egypt, even though there might be some parts of it that look good. If I got to correct you, I'll correct you with somebody that's even worse, has no good parts. Verse 7, and my people are bent to backsliding from me. Though they call them to the Most High, none at all would exalt him. Okay, you know how you return to God? According to that verse right there is it's just exalt him. When you exalt him, you know what that does? It shines a bright, clear, pure, holy light that makes a division and shows the opposites of right and wrong, righteousness and wickedness. That's the name of the game. I mean, that's just the basics of the Bible, is the Bible's given to show man what's right and identify where the wrong is. Opposites. That's our message. We've made it through the intro. Opposites. The first point is this. Opposites attract. They do. For some reason, they're, they seem to be appealing. They say, why do men like intelligent women? Because opposites attract. I don't know that that's so, but that's what they say. Opposites attract in scholarship look at it in first kings first kings 4 first kings 4 verse 30 god intends you to be wise and to get some education and some wisdom he gave us a book for it so you know if he did that the devil's going to do it on the other side there's going to be an opposite for it first kings 4 verse 30 and solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of you know this is the opposite Egypt. Okay, so Egypt has some wisdom, but it's just phony. It's false. So Egypt's wisdom is going to be poured out, and the invitation's going to be sent, come join our wisdom party. They did it for Solomon. Solomon was handed wisdom from God, didn't have to do anything special for it. However, before his life is over, he's joined forces with Egypt. Matter of fact, he gets a favorite wife from Egypt. Bad news. The phony versions come out of Egypt. It's false wisdom. Get it in Acts 7. Acts 7 verse 22. Acts 7 verse 22. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Okay, so early on, Moses was given all of the education of the devil. All, all the wicked education. As smart as Egypt was or thought they were, they gave it to him. But something happened before that. Before that, he was in his parents' house, the real parents, and given real education. That one stuck. The world has sent off all of their, the Christian world has sent off their children to the Egyptian schools to get an education. Sometimes it sticks and sometimes it doesn't. The question is this, has, have they gotten the real education? The real education is from God, not what Egypt tries to teach them. He says, look down at verse 38. But this is he, speaking of Moses, that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. When it came to helping all of the people, Egypt's wisdom did him no good. He had to get a direct source from God. And that's the foundation for the Old Testament right there. He says that wisdom counted. Egypt's didn't count for anything. Ship. There's an opposite scholarship to what's true. You can count on it. You're going to, it's going to confront you. Not only that, there's speed. I don't mean the drug, but maybe. <laughs> First Kings 10. First Kings 10. First Kings 10, verse 28. Hey, you get something done. The world we live in right now is everything is sped up. You've got to do faster and more and quicker and you couldn't have done that yesterday. First Kings 10, verse 28. And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt. We need some horses. They're fast. You know what his old dad did. His dad had a mule. Let's upgrade that thing. Let's trade that one in. That's right. He wanted a Mustang. Verse 29. And a chariot. Okay, that's that's highfalutin right there. That's not just one horse. That's multiple horses. And it's riding in style. Speed. That's the name of the game. Get it done quicker and faster. That's not what God says. The word of God he's going to teach you is what? Line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a whole bunch and there no. Here a little. There a little. That's the way God does it. You can work yourself to death. It seems like you could study a, a thousand hours 
and learn whatever it is you wanted to learn. You could have only five minutes that you could study and learn the same amount. God's decided what little you're qualified to learn. And it seems like it's just going to be a little bit here and a little bit there, just like he said. You can't speed it up. You know what happens when you start speeding it up? You run into a phony um, cult. That's how the cults are built is they want to impress you with all they know. Sometimes you don't need to know a whole bunch because you hadn't used a little bit you already know. Speed's not really good. For Solomon, it wasn't good. Not only that, it's style. <laughs> there's a right style and there's a wrong style. Get Proverbs 7. Proverbs 7, verse 16. The world's got some styles that Christians don't have any part, uh, any business being part of. Just because it's in style doesn't mean it's something you should do. A, an original. Be the one who sets the style. If you like polka dot with stripes, then wear it. I don't care. But don't don't ask the world what you're supposed to wear. Look at here's where Solomon's going astray. Proverbs seven verse sixteen. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry. This is a wicked woman with carved works with fine linen of Egypt. Now what's linen? In the Bible, we know it from Revelation. It's the righteousness of the saints. She says, from Egypt, of Egypt. What? That's a cult that appears to be religious on the outside. But inside, it's doctrines of devil. That's the style. That's the world's style. It's in fashion. People are attracted to it. Don't get the world's wisdom. There's an opposite. Look at Ezekiel 27. Isaiah 27, verse 7. Ezekiel 27, he says, Fine linen wrote with broidered work from Egypt was that which thou spreadest forth to be thy sail, blue and purple from the isles of Elisa, was that which covered thee. Uh, demonic stuff can be covered with a thin veneer of righteous. Just because somebody knows how to speak the right ling lingo, lingo, say some Christian words, and say hallelujah every now and then, <laughs> doesn't mean there's any content to what they're saying. The world, the devil knows how to be religious. He's got ministry. And he showed up to Eve. You know, the first things we read about him is he's telling her how to be like God. Sounds like he's a real religious guru, doesn't it? He is. There's an opposite to what's true. Always will be. Not only that, we've seen scholarship, speed, style, but also strength. Isaiah 30. Isaiah 30, verse 2. Isaiah 30, verse 2. You know how you get strong? You prove you're weak. You go to the gym and you pick up a weight and you struggle to pick it up. That's exhibiting how weak you are. But you keep struggling to pick it up, and eventually you build some muscle. That's the right way. You know, the wrong way is to take a pill to appear as though you have muscle. The steroid. It'll make these muscles pop out. You don't have to have any strength under it. Just have these big bulges. That's the opposite of what should be true. Look at it in Isaiah 30. Isaiah 30, verse 2. That walk to go down into Egypt, and if not ask at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. Steroids don't end with a good, happy, healthy life. They destroy the body when they're done. He's saying the same of Egypt. Here's the opposite of what should be if you go down to Egypt and get your help from the world. He says it's not going to end well. Jeremiah 46. Jeremiah 46 verse 8. You know, when we look back at history, we don't think of Egypt as being the great um, conquering force. So it's odd to me that God makes Egypt out to be such a bad dude. They're the arch enemy throughout the Bible. But yet we look at the history of nations and Egypt has played a minor role, not any major role. Babylon, I would say, had a stronger, mightier reign than that of Egypt. But God says, no, notice Egypt, that's the bad one. Uh, Jeremiah 46, verse 8. Egypt riseth up like a flood, and his waters are moved like the rivers. He saith, I will go up and will cover the earth. I will destroy the city and the inhabitants thereof. One reason God hates Egypt is because Egypt 
hates one city. The Egypt's got its own city that it wants to exalt. There's always an opposite for the truth. If there's a Jerusalem, there's a Babylon. You can count on it. Guess what? Opposites, like we said, attract. There'll be things about Babylon that looks attractive, but you got to remember it's a phone. Look at uh, not only that, we've seen scholarship, speed, style, strength. The next thing is servant. The way we serve God is not the way the devil gets his servant. The problem with Israel is God said early on, I don't want you to worship me the way the heathen are worshiping their God. Not for There's an opposite. The church nowadays has run around and you could compare it side by side with the pagans. The kundalini yoga produces the very same thing the charismatic tongues do. The, the shaking and the quaking and all that stuff is the very same thing you can find in India with the cults. No different. They've been speaking in tongues for thousands of years before a charismatic was ever born. There's no difference. He says, don't worship me the way the heathen are being worship, worshiping their God. Look at service is important to God, but it's got to be done right. Look at it in Exodus, Exodus 8, Exodus 8, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, go unto Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Now, the inference here is this. If you're in Egypt, it's not going to be uh, possible for you to serve God the way he intends. Egypt gets a hold of you. It does a number on your mind, and you're not free to serve God the way he wants to be served. That's what he's saying here. Through Moses, he's saying, go down there and tell Pharaoh, my people need to have the freedom to serve me the way I want to be served. Service is the thing that God pushed as the importance for releasing his people from Egypt. I think it's 20 times, I didn't count them all, but 20 times where God says they need to serve me over and over before they get out of Egypt. Before they get out of Egypt, he's saying, I'm wanting service and you're not giving it to me the way you should be down there in Egypt. Get out here and I'll get the service I need. Now, they didn't really end up doing it, but that was the, the point. Exodus, Exodus 8, Exodus 8, verse 20. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning, and stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Sounds like God's on a broken record here. I want some service. Pharaoh's getting it. He's forcing his people to serve him. And matter of fact, he's got Israelites caught up in that mess, and he's making them serve him. God says, no, my people are done serving Egypt. Let them loose. They're going to come out here and serve me. Exodus, uh, Exodus 10, Exodus 10, verse 3. I got a whole list of them here. I'm not going to give you the list. I'm just going to jump through and give you a few of them. And Moses and Aaron came unto Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. Here the king of pride is on display. God said, the problem is, my people are not able to serve me because a proud king is trying to block them from doing it. There's coming a day where the political system is going to block Christians from being able to serve God the right way. It's happened historically all the way through. The churches, it's not, um, God's not guaranteed man to have the freedom to worship publicly him. But he's still going to demand service. You've got to find a way to serve him. Here, he said, let my people go. That they That's all right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's the way it's... A... That's right. It's going that way. That That's the way the, um, the dispensation always ends, right back where it began. Look at it in Joshua, Joshua 24. To think we can just serve God and snap our fingers and do it is one thing, and we could come up with some fleshly ways of doing it. That doesn't mean God accepts it. Here's the scary part. Joshua 24, 19. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye cannot serve the Lord, huh? for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sin. That is, to serve God, it's got to be out of sincerity and truth. You know, the way we normally do it is out of formality. We say this is the way it's always been done or this is what I view and once you start putting this is how I do it, you've eliminated God. God, how do you want me to do it? 
That should be the phrase. And how does scripture say to do this? Rather than this is the way we've always done it or this is how I'm going to do it. <laughs> God wants service, but he wants to be in control of how he serves. All right, we made it through one point. What time have we gotten to? Oh, we got time for maybe one more. Opposites exact. Opposites attract and opposites also exact. That is, they have a requirement. You know what opposites exact? Many times they're exacting revenge. The world hates you and it doesn't even know why. It hates Christians. It makes no sense why they, why they hate Christians. I think the greatest disp display of it is the Democrats going after Trump. It's a picture, but not for Democrats and Republicans. It's a picture for Christians versus pagans. The righteous versus wicked. I'm not saying Trump's righteous. I'm saying God just painted a picture for us to look at. That's the way it should be. You should feel that conflict in your own self. When you wake up and look in the mirror, that's the bad guy. And the Spirit of God in you is fighting that character because he wants to do wicked revenge. Look at it in Exodus 1. Here's how wicked it is. Exodus 1, verse 15. God's already promised way back in Genesis 3 that he's getting a, a seed that's going to come through. And it's going to crush the devil. So he ain't happy about it. The opposite shows murder. He's a murderer from the beginning. Revenge. He's, mad. He's been mad since Isaiah chapter 14. And God says, nope, you can't have my seed. Sorry. <laughs> Kicked him out. From then on, he's got a grudge and he's going to take revenge. Not on God because he's not that powerful. You know where he's coming after? Coming after us. We're the weakling. We're the weak link. <laughs> So we got to be fortified. Look at it in Proverbs 24, Proverbs 24, verse 11. Proverbs 24, 11. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that are ready to be slain. Let's think about it a minute. You could do something to help those who are delivered to death. That is, the devil's decided, according to our other passage, that he's going to go after and kill all the male seed. And the midwife says, <clears throat> nope. Not with my hands. <laughs> they do what the verse says. They deliver those that are declared to be put to death. Now, let's make the practical application is this. The devil's coming after all of us. When you see him attacking your brother or sister, you can help them. Or you can join forces with the devil and just ignore it. He said, forbear. That is, you could do something and you didn't do it. Just forbear. That's Laodicea. That's the, I could care less, you know. That, live and let live. Look at the rest of the verse. He says, <clears throat> verse 12. If thou sayest, behold, we knew it not. Doth not he that ponder the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth he not know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his work? <clears throat> that is, the devil's coming after us. He's on a revenge party. It's us. He's not really after us. He's after God. But it's us that is in the way. And we're the easy target. He's target practicing with us. So we should help anybody we can. Get your head down. Get back in the foxhole. Help them any way we can. He's, God says, or the Bible says, God's noting who's doing what. He knows who knew what. Oof, that's convicting. It's not only rage, it's revenge. Look at it in Acts 7. Acts 7, verse 34. Acts 7, 34. Moses has been stuck on the backside of the wilderness for 40 years. He gave up trying to help. He said, I tried to deliver. I saw someone down there doing wickedness to God's people. You know, he was beating this guy mercilessly, and he didn't deserve it. And I took matters in my own hand. Then the next day I go out, and my people are being idiots. And so I tried to help them. And what happened? They got mad at me. They wanted to tattle on me. I ran off. Done with it. Acts 7, verse 34. God speaks now. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt. And I've heard their groanings and am come down to deliver them. That sounds exciting. God's going to go deliver them. Moses, if I'd been Moses, I would have said, good, I'm going to sit right here and watch it. Because that's what he said. God says, I'm doing it. God doesn't do anything without doing it through someone. Unfortunately, he's chosen to use human flesh to exhibit his power. That means you and I. He says, now come and I will send thee 
into Egypt. No wonder Moses is the type of Jesus Christ. That's how we started our passage, was in uh, Matthew 2. God made sure that Jesus Christ got sent to Egypt so he could pull him out. Same thing right here. God says, my people need to be delivered. Go to Egypt and get them out. We're in Egypt. I'm sorry. There's nothing we can do about it. We're not so called to be hermits. We'll hold up in a cave somewhere, live off grid. That'd be nice, but we can't do it. Because our mission field is the world. It'd be nice to be able to get out of Egypt. But the only Egypt we need to get out is the one that's crawled into our heart. That one we need to get rid of. But he says, go to Egypt and there we'll do some deliver. Because that's God's goal. In Revelation 11. Revelation 11 verse 8. Here's uh, the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah in the tribulation. Revelation 11 verse 8. And their dead bodies. Hmm, that's what the devil does. Is He's the... He's the merchant of death. He loves to kill. Sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. That's the devil. Revelation 11, 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Two things. If God wants to say something bad about a place, <laughs> he calls it Sodom. Therefore, every TV show is pushing it. Or he calls it... Egypt, the thing that's affected the church. There also our Lord was crucified. They of the people, uh, and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put into put in grave. That is, it's got the whole world worked up. They've joined forces with Egypt and said anytime we can uh, make an inroad against something righteous, will rejoice over it. There's an opposite. There's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents. So you know on earth, the opposite does happen. There's rejoicing in Egypt when one Christian falls, or the devil has a seeming victory in this area or that. You can look at Christianity, even though there's a bunch of phony ones out there. You can look at the leaders that are uh, public figures that have fallen. You know, they're always publicly outed and pushed on all the news programs and news media. And we can identify where they were wrong and how phony they were. It still gives a stink to Christianity. I don't care how phony it was, it shouldn't have happened. Wickedness is wickedness. Here he says, he puts them in the street and kills them publicly. He wants the whole world to see it. Same thing they did with John the Baptist. Chop his head off. Look at verse 10. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts one to another. Those two prophets, uh, because those two prophets tormented them that dwell upon the earth. That is, righteousness is painful to the one who wants to live in wickedness. When you're torturing the devil's crowd, he's going to get revenge. That's the way it is. It's the way it's supposed to be. Righteousness, when it's put in the face of the devil, it hurts him. It says it's tormenting him, torturing him. So no wonder he's coming after anybody who will do it. And in the tribulation, there's two. He's going to cut their heads off, but they won't stay with their heads cut off for long. They'll jump up. And Moses will tell Elijah, hand me that head over there. <laughs> and they get out, but they fly right north. All right, we made it through two points. Got about five more to go. Uh, we'll pick that up um, maybe tonight.